Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome along to the 2019 Marion Lecture. It's great to have you all here. This is, of course, the lecture with the longest title in the world. After the angel departed, seeking God, hints and glimpses of the God within. So tonight, in the presence of each other and our God, we have the opportunity to gather in a privileged way to share headspace and heart space, to hear and to engage with our international guest, Dr Bonnie Thurston. My name's Kate Fogarty. I'm a member of the Marist Association, like many of you here, and I'm extremely proud to welcome you here this evening to this year's lecture. I'd like to issue a special welcome to everybody joining us via the online broadcast tonight. Um, we're aware that there are people with us from all around the country, from Perth to Alice Springs, from Sale to Cairns. People gathered in small and large groups to share this time together. And I'm going to give a special shout out now to Julia Wake, who's one of our Melbourne members. She and her daughter are watching this from the emergency ward at a local hospital where her daughter's heard her wrist at footy training. So <laughs> special hello to Julia. So we hope that wherever you are, you find this evening a community experience, both uplifting and enriching. Most of all, we pray that these opportunities to gather, whether in person or online in spirit, help build both our association and our church into a place where God is always recognised, welcomed and responded to, as we say as Marists, with passion, audacity and joy. As we gather here in Melbourne, we acknowledge and pay our respects to the Wurundjeri people, the traditional custodians of the lands and waterways of this place. We thank them for their continued hospitality and acknowledge and celebrate the continuation of a living culture that has a unique role in this region. We also acknowledge the elders past and present, as well as the emerging leaders of tomorrow. We thank them for their wisdom and their guidance as we walk in their footsteps. If you're like me, you're finding this evening's, or the title of this evening's lecture exciting and invigorating. What indeed could possibly have occurred after the angel departed? And what can that mean for us, believers like Mary, frequently surprised by the moment God weaves into the patterns of our lives? To help us think, dream, ponder and pray through it, we have a reliable and knowledgeable guide with us this evening. So let me introduce to you our presenter, Dr Bonnie Thurston. Bonnie is a native of southern West Virginia and by her own admission currently lives quietly. Bonnie's PhD was a dissertation on Thomas Merton and her prolific writings since then have broadened our collective appreciation and understandings of his insights into the mystical and especially our shared heart space with the people of Eastern religions. Bonnie was ordained in 1984 and has served as co-pastor, pastor or interim of five churches, including twice in overseas ministries. She's an experienced spiritual director and retreat leader. Her poetry appears frequently in religious periodicals and she's authored six volumes of verse amongst many other books. And I might just take this opportunity to let people know that Pauline Media have done um, some great deals for us on Bonnie's books. They're just packing up out the front there now, but they have left some of these forms for those who are here this evening. And if everybody playing along at home would like to jump on the Pauline Ministries website, they have ordered in a special big, huge um, uh, amount of Bonnie's books for us to uh, enjoy over the coming weeks and months. Bonnie's an avid walker, a reader, a gardener and cook. She enjoys classical music and loves the West Virginian hills. We're very blessed to have her in Australia with us to share her wisdom and her glimpses of the God within. Please join me in making welcome Dr Bonnie Thurston. Thank you for that very generous introduction. I'm very grateful to you. I'm grateful to the Marist Brothers and the Marist Association for inviting me out to Australia. It is a long way from home. Uh, and thanks all of you for coming this evening after a day of work. Um, it's hard to 
get energized to come out again, so I'm very appreciative that you're here with me. For a total of about 12 years, I taught at a Jesuit university, and for the last several years, about 85% of my work has been with Roman Catholics. And I've noticed that Roman Catholics are often surprised that I, a historically Protestant person, have a great devotion to the Blessed Virgin Mary. And um, on a good day, this amuses me. And on a bad day, I want to say, what, do you think you own her? <laughs> Mary, as the mother of Jesus, is by definition our mother because we're brothers and sisters to one another by virtue of our discipleship to him. Um, although I one time undertook a long and scholarly study of Our Lady, I don't really presume to know Mary from Roman Catholic um, systematic theology or Mariology or for the Greek, from the Greek fathers of the Orthodox Church or the councils. In, insofar as I know her, I know her from biblical texts, um, from the Compline, where we sing the Salve at the end of the evening, and from the icons of the Eastern and Western churches. And she's helped me out more than once with my own mother, who also had a child whose vocation she didn't understand. And Mary got that sorted out for us. So I would recommend and invite you to join me as we begin this evening with a Hail Mary and just a moment of silence to settle ourselves. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art you among women, and blessed is the fruit of your womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners now. I'm purposely abandoning a scholarly stance vis-a-vis -vis Mary to share with you some personal reflections on Mary uh, that I observed from chapters 1 and 2 of Luke's Gospel, especially the stories of the Annunciation, the Visitation, and the Magnificat. And as I pondered those stories, what I discovered, rather to my surprise, was that the verse that I most resonated to was the last bit of verse 38 and the angel departed from her. And the question that arose for me then, well, was what, does Mary, what did Mary do then? After the big decisive moments of life when we've said yes and metaphorically the angel departs from us, what and with whom and how do we respond? And we'll turn to that question momentarily, but first I thought we might, so that we'd all have a common playing field, quickly review the biography of Mary in the New Testament. Um, so that's the first section on your outline, and it will be, I think, very brief. Put on your trainers, here we go. Um, the New Testament's first reference to Mary doesn't name her, and it's not in the Gospels. It's Paul's remark in the letter to the Galatians when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son, born of a woman, that we might receive adoption as children. Born of a woman suggests that without the agency of a human mother, there could have been no incarnation, and that incarnation was necessary to make us children of God and siblings to one another. Carol Hauslander, a writer whom some of you probably have the right hair color to remember, wrote in her book, The Read of God, it is the purpose for which something is made that decides the material used. It is the purpose for which something is made that decides the material used, created at the beginning in God's image, female flesh, was deemed the proper material to inaugurate human salvation. In chapter one of New Seeds of Contemplation, writing of Mary, Thomas Merton noted, it is a very special manifestation of God's respect for his creatures, and particularly the body which was destined to be the temple of his glory, that we are saved through Mary. 
suggesting to me that theologies that denigrate the female body are not Christian theologies. So throw away the holy cards of Mary in the filmy blue nightgown. Gospel images of Mary are images of strength and resourcefulness, and her story resonates with Hebrew scripture. It begins with Matthew's genealogy, a typical beginning for a Jewish uh, work in which Our Lady appears in a line of unusual and shall we say sexually unconventional women. Rahab the harlot, Ruth the Moabitess, the unnamed wife of Uriah the Hittite to whom King David took a fancy. At the time of Gabriel's Annunciation, Luke introduces Mary as a girl of marriageable age, 12 to 14 years old in Roman Palestine, a woman of marriageable age who chose to cooperate with God over whom God's spirit moved as it moved over the waters of creation and as it hovered over the tabernacle in the wilderness. It's the same Greek verb in all of those three cases. Mary's visit to Elizabeth, also unconventionally pregnant, culminates in a manifesto for social change, which echoes Hannah's song and the prophets in the Psalms. Luke's birth story focuses on Mary, whose presentation in the temple demonstrates her Jewish observance and predicts a joyful and ominous future for her child. Matthew focuses on Joseph, who, like his patriarchal namesake, exhibits obedience to dreams and political acumen and a resourcefulness that kept his family, who for a time were refugees in Egypt, safe. And then the Holy Family returned to Galilee, which is surprising because they should have, by tradition, gone to Nazareth. I'm sorry, returned to Joseph's home but they returned to Mary's home. I wonder if it was another instance of St. Joseph's wisdom not to have them so close to Jerusalem and the headquarters of the Romans and the religious authorities in Judaism. Family made regular religious pilgrimages to Jerusalem and undoubtedly had the same fears and struggles and joys of a normal family. After Jesus leaves home to follow his vocation, John's gospel introduces Mary at the wedding in Cana, where he does my personal favorite miracle. The predicted sword pierces Mary's heart when Jesus redefines family, and at his crucifixion where she is present with the other women. And Acts includes her with the nascent church, and after that, Silence. Second century writers, like the Proto-Evangelium of James, attempted to fill in her biography, but in fact, Mary's life is largely in shadow. Hers, wrote Thomas Merton, was the most hidden of sanctities. It's a beautiful turn of phrase, the most hidden of sanctities. And yet, Carol Hauslander says, it's through the ordinary human life and the things of every hour of every day that union with God comes about. The angel departed from her. Immediately after Mary says, yes, I'll do this incredible thing, I'll surrender completely to God, the heavenly messenger leaves her to face alone the practical consequences of her fiat. We know, as Paul assumed in the second letter to the church at Corinth, that in Jesus all God's promises are a yes. But can Mary have known that? I have to say, her initial situation reminds me of nothing so much as Jesus on the cross when he cries out, my Lord, my Lord, 
Where, why have you abandoned me? Jesus, too, chose complete surrender and obedience to God, and God apparently withdrew and left him hanging there. After the wonderful, perplexing, angelic announcement and after Mary's eternally significant fiat, then what? After the angel departed from her whom all generations call blessed, after the angelic visitation, there was the return to ordinary human life and the things of every hour of every day, the drudgery of carrying water and cleaning and cooking and what must have been the ever-present first century equivalent of diapers. One wonders. There must have been fear of telling her mother and fear of telling that good man, Joseph, her betrothed, what had transpired. And there certainly must have been the excitement and misery. Uh, sorry, that was an interesting Freudian slip in view of the next part of the sentence. There was certainly the excitement and mystery <laughs> that pregnant women <laughs> experience. <laughs> well, I got it right the first time, didn't I? <laughs> A new life within and the uncertainty of bringing it forth in danger into a far less than perfect world. And there was only what Mary knew, and only Mary can know. And our spiritual lives beat to the same rhythm of ordinary family life, of job and parish and play and health and sickness and sadness and death. Maybe not as dramatically as Our Lady, but we too experience annunciations. There are all, for all of us, moments when life presents a, to us choices that will have important and unfathomable consequences. You're smiling, you know what I mean. We too experience moments of great spiritual significance with consequences beyond what we can envision or dream. And then what? Scripture gives us glimpses of how Mary responded to the changes and crises that were precipitated by Gabriel's announcement. She wasn't forced. She chose to say yes. And then, as we must, she moved forward not knowing what would come next. What Mary did when the angel departed, I suggest, um, really revolved around four responses. Uh, and they are the middle part of your outline and what will be the next about 25 minutes of our time together. She accepted her vulnerability. She sought community. She pondered. And she trusted. The first of Mary's responses to change and crisis is to accept vulnerability. And I think it's the question, now what? And I think it's the hardest of the four for most of us. She was the passive recipient of God's choice, which she actively accepted. She received. She was not yet the giver. Writing of the Council of Trent in 1546, that declaration of that Mary was without sin, Karl Rahner speaks of, she who wills to be nothing but total receptivity. She who wills to be nothing but total receptivity. Carol Hauslander says she was not asked to do anything herself, but to let something be done to her. Most of us find it hard to be done to. Very little of the culture of which I am a product teaches me the value of passivity or receptivity. 
but Mary does. Her acceptance of vulnerability and the humility from which it sprang became the critical turning points in salvation history. Sometimes we serve best by accepting our weakness. As Milton said in the sonnet on his blindness, they also serve who only sit and wait. Beverly Robert Scaventa, a Protestant biblical scholar at Princeton who wrote a wonderful book on Mary, places vulnerability as the first of three biblical motifs in the life of Mary. At every level, the angel's unexpected announcement made Mary vulnerable. Vulnerable spiritually and religiously. She was a Jew and a monotheist. What could this son of God business mean? How would things change spiritually? Good heavens, what will the rabbis say? She was vulnerable psychologically. She could not know in advance how those she knew and loved would respond to her circumstances. How would she grow into this? Or was her experience what we would now call pathological? Could Mary possibly have wondered, am I crazy or what? Physically, she was a village girl. People lived in close community. Mary would have known firsthand about infant and maternal mortality. In ancient Israel, at the time of Mary, the average age of a woman was 30 years old. She lived, on average, 30 years, largely due to the dangers of pregnancy. And in her first pregnancy, what woman knows will happen to her or to her body or to her baby? She was vulnerable socially. She was a village girl, and as we all know, in villages, people talk. My husband came from a small farming village in Oregon, and he said of his home village, nothing ever happened there, but enough was said to make up for it. <laughs> what will Mary, Mary's neighbors say when the baby bump shows? And what will they say about her parents? What will they say about Joseph? But to be vulnerable is not to be helpless, nor is it to be a victim. Real acceptance is neither passive resignation nor simple capitulation, but active imagination, open-hearted, a reframing of what is given to us to work with. That's a quotation from American writer Marilyn McIntyre. Mary was not forced, she chose, and choice is always an act of strength. She exhibited courage in the face of vulnerability, which is an unavoidable part of what it means to be a creature of God's making. There are certain aspects of Christian life which are of necessity in passive voice. We do not act, we are acted upon. Michael Casey, in his book, Strangers to the City, writes, the spiritual life is not a matter of achievement, but of being the recipient of God's benevolence. The spiritual life is not something we achieve. It is to be the recipient of God's benevolence, and that requires passivity and expectant openness, which I think is extraordinarily difficult for us. Mostly we want to get busy and do something because if we do something, that puts us in our own eyes in a position of power. We seem terrified of what we can only learn in weakness and in waiting by accepting our vulnerability. In her vulnerability, Mary, and here I quote Houselander again, was not asked to renounce anything, but to receive an incredible gift. Her vulnerability allowed her 
and subsequently us, to receive God's extraordinary gift of Jesus the Christ. Recognition of vulnerability does not make us weak. It makes us humble. And humility makes us open to new ideas, to what comes next. It opens the door to the future. I hope you know the little book called The Book of Joy, which records the conversations between His Holiness the Dalai Lama and Bishop Desmond Tutu. The Dalai Lama suggested in a conversation with Bishop Tutu, if you remain humble, then there is the possibility to keep learning. And he quoted a Tibetan proverb, which sounds to me uncannily applicable to Mary. Wisdom is like rainwater. It gathers in low places. It's a pretty good proverb for an arid land. Wisdom is like rainwater. It gathers in low places. Accepting vulnerability facilitates the humility that in practice makes it possible for us in the face of change to deepen and grow. And frankly, it also puts us at the mercy of unknowing. So, unless we are intractably foolish, we seek the wise counsel of others. And this is what Mary did next. She sought community. The question was, now who? St. Luke arranges the narrative so that immediately after the Annunciation and the angel departs from her, and now I'm quoting Luke, Mary set out with haste to a Judean town in the hill country where she entered the house of Zechariah and greeted Elizabeth. Immediately after the angel departed, Mary sought the community of another woman, in this case an older woman and a family member. You'll remember that in chapter 1, Luke has introduced Zechariah and Elizabeth as the paradigmatically, biblically righteous but childless couple whom Gabriel also visited and announced another unusual pregnancy. I suspect that Mary sought Elizabeth's country not only because she was a relative and righteous, and lived blamelessly, now quoting Luke, according to all the commandments and regulations of the Lord, but because she too has an out-of-the-ordinary pregnancy. Post-menopausal Elizabeth, now do the math, is six months pregnant, and so she can give Mary practical advice. Mary stays with her three months. Got that? full term. Maybe Mary attended or was nearby when John was born, and then after some acquaintance with a newborn in her own trimester, Mary heads back up, excuse me, heads back down the Jordan Valley, or sorry, back up the Jordan Valley to Nazareth. Why else would Luke have been so careful to give us the series of dates so that we would figure this out? Lots of women have done this. I like to imagine that the younger Mary went down to Judea and stayed to help her older relative with the ordinary tasks that you have to do when a baby's born. In any case, in her own situation of crisis and change, Mary sought the community of a good, religiously observant, older person in similar circumstances. In meeting with Elizabeth, Mary's own experience was confirmed. She received a blessing because of her own trust in God. And I reckon some practical information about pregnancy, childbirth, and newborns. Life is of a piece. It is not partially spiritual and partially physical or bodily. That truth was stated succinctly by Thomas Merton, who said, a life is either all spiritual or not spiritual at all. So to talk about pregnancy and Mary and childbirth and this wonderful thing that's happening seems to me exactly the right thing to do. Because if we are 
integrated human beings, our spirituality is unified. As her story unfolds, Luke is careful to tell us that Mary, in the company of Joseph, in the community of their family, also sought religious community. She doesn't cut herself off from the rituals and traditions of the Jewish community of faith. It's interesting to me that it's Luke, the Gentile evangelist, who stresses Mary's rootedness in Jewish community. Both she and Elizabeth have their sons circumcised according to Jewish practice. Luke writes of the time for her purification according to the law of Moses and the presentation of Jesus to the Lord as is written in the law of the Lord for which the Holy Family traveled down to Jerusalem where they heard both reassuring confirmations and dark predictions. In fact, Luke says every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the festival of Passover. That's really unusual. Passover for Jews in the first century was like the Hajj for Muslims. You really only did it or once in your lifetime and only if certain conditions were fulfilled. Every year, Luke says, his parents went to Jerusalem for Passover. Point, part of the community that Mary sought was that of the ordinary liturgical life of her religious tradition. She went to Mass on Sunday. She observed the days of obligation. It was ordinary life in which her spirituality unfolded. It depicts for me a fundamental fact of life in change and crisis. We cannot go it alone. Nobody can. Any serious experience of vulnerability teaches us this. In the face of change and crisis, Mary depended upon and was embraced by an individual and a community, both of her family and of her religious tradition. In the theological meditations on Mary, thank you very much, Carl Rahner wrote, we are those who have been called away from the loneliness and isolation of the individual into the unity of the love and grace of God. We are those who have been called away from the loneliness and isolation of the individual into the unity of the grace of God. Of this, Mary was our model. And then, when the angel departed, Mary pondered. And the question was, now how? When the angel departed, <clears throat> there ensued a passive dimension of Mary's acceptance of vulnerability in which her question was, now what? It followed with the more active response of seeking community in which the question was, now who? And paradoxically, the answer to the question, now how, is evident in probably the most contemplative aspect of Mary's spirituality. At three points in the narrative of Mary's motherhood, Luke is at pains to tell us that she pondered. She pondered at the angelic greeting. She pondered at the visitation by the shepherds. And she pondered when Jesus said to her, in effect, at 12 years old, I wasn't lost, I chose to stay here. Now, the interesting thing about this, and this was your gift to me, because for the millions of times, well, okay, the dozens of times, that I have read the story in the Greek, I assumed the English translation was correct. And every word in English is pondered. It's a different word in each instance in Greek. And each of those words, as you trace them through, suggests, gives us the shadowiest kind of glimpse of the interior life of Mary. So take a big, deep breath, because we're going to do etymology. 
no, no, not about bugs, of which you have many poisonous in this country. We're going to do etymology, and if you want to see the words I've transliterated for, the, for you on the outline. When Mary ponders the first time at the greeting of Gabriel, the Greek word is dialogizomai, from which we get the English word dialogue. And it means to discuss, to argue, to reason, to debate. It suggests an intellectual function. Second instance, in response to the shepherd's visit, the Greek is sumbalusa. It really literally means to, to throw two things side by side. Sum means together, balo is to throw. So she puts these things together. It should be translated encounter, confer, or put together for comparison. Is this suggestion then of Luke in changing the word that Mary is pondering the various experiences she has had and compared them as a way of coming to understanding? Are you with me? You're supposed to nod or do like this. I'm a teacher. If you do like this, I'll say some more. If you do like this, we'll finish sooner. <laughs> um, Mary is pondering the experiences she's had. She's, she's moved from an intellectual kind of response to the kind of thing we do in our hearts when we bring our old experiences together with our new experiences to try to make sense of things. Does that make discernment sense, those of you who are spiritual directors? And the third word that is translated ponder into English is actually treasured, dia terepo, which, which, which describes really, I think, Mary's response to the life of Jesus in Nazareth. The word means to guard, to keep, or to treasure up. What mother hasn't seen certain things that her child did or father seen something that his child did and thought, I'm going to remember this forever. Right, parents? This is, a, this is a moment that I will treasure. I'll keep it. I'll protect it. From intellectualization to heart pondering to saying what I have seen, I'm going to treasure forever is a fascinating process. We can't know with any certainty what Mary's inner life was. If she shared it with anyone, the New Testament writers either weren't privy to it or chose not to record it. But I think this very subtle etymology in Luke suggests a deepening and a movement of her interior life toward treasuring what it was that had happened to her. All this occurred in the heart, and I could talk for a long time about the heart because it was, in the Greco-Roman world, the center of personhood. Not the center of emotion, but the center of volition and will. The heart was the organ with which people thought and made decisions. It was the inwardness of our personhood in its full spiritual depth. She did all of this in her heart. She doesn't, as Beverly Gaventer writes, wait passively for someone to explain things to her. She takes an act active part by thinking, reflecting, and considering. And Professor Gaventer says, Mary is initiating Christian contemplation. Maybe we have gotten it wrong. Maybe it is not Mary of Bethany who epitomizes Christian contemplation, but Mary of Nazareth. In response to change and crisis, she ponders before she responds, she reflects on her experiences, and she treasures them in her heart. What Mary bore in her womb, writes Andrew Luth, she ponders in her heart. The mystery of the revelation of the unknowable God in the incarnation is apprehended 
in the beholding of the glory seen in the incarnate word, and Mary is the type of that contemplative wonder and adoration. End of quotation. And finally, did you think we wouldn't get to finally? As the other responses are stripped away, I think the very heart's core of Mary's response to change in crisis was trust. Trust. In our world, we trust practically nobody. Certainly not our governments and religious institutions, much less each other individually. We stagger, I think, mentally to understand trust as the sparkling diamond hard core of Mary's response to God's invitation. Being a pedant, I looked up the English word trust in the American Collegiate Dictionary, which is the dictionary we give our kids before they go off to university. And I was struck because the first three dictionary definitions of trust sound remarkably Mariological to me in context. Number one, assured reliance on the character, ability, strength, or truth of someone or something. Pick. Number two, one in which such confidence is placed. Tick, tick. Number three, a dependence on something future or contingent. One, the one Mary trusted was and continues to be faithful. Mary was assured of the trustworthiness of the one for whom the angel Gabriel spoke. She depended upon God for a future which was completely contingent on the trustworthiness of the promiser. That is what faith is, writes Carol Hauslander. It is believing something because God has told us it is so. It is not believing something because we feel that it's true or because we want it to be true or because our reason can encircle it. Truth would be a very small and petty thing if it would fit into our minds." End of quote. That's an interesting definition of trust. Believing something because God told us it was true. It's the secular cousin of our theological word faith, which in practice means something like believing what we can't prove. Hauslander's meditation on Mary gives this profound and shocking definition that trust is believing because God told us it was so. Do you happen to remember what Elizabeth said when the baby leaped in her womb and she was filled with the Holy Spirit at the visitation, she blessed Mary with these words. Blessed is she who believed that there would be a fulfillment of what was spoken to her by the Lord. Elizabeth doesn't bless Mary because God's promises to her have been fulfilled but because Mary believed that they would be. Elizabeth blesses Mary's trust in what God will do, even if at the moment things are a little dicey for both of those women. Thomas Merton observed that Mary's chief glory is the pure obedience of faith. Mary, I suggest to you, is the incarnation of the definition of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. It is the assurance of things hoped for and the conviction of things not seen. In the face of change and crisis, Mary moved forward in trust, trusting God, trusting Joseph, trusting her family, trusting her religious community. And later, she trusted Jesus to do something about the lack of wine. Mary exhibited blind trust in God. 
In her book, The Read of God, House Lander says simply, the remedy for fear is trust in God. And I remind you, she wrote that at the height of the Battle of Britain, when nobody knew what was going to happen. The remedy for fear is trust in God, absolutely true and infinitely easier said than done. Mary stands by and she lives a very eloquent, quiet form of faithfulness. She stands by not calling attention to herself, simple, not fancy or complex or fashionable or up to the minute, eloquent in the fact that she says almost nothing, and paradoxically in her almost complete silence in the New Testament, Our Lady is one of its most eloquent characters, certainly one of its paradigms of faith and trust. Her sanctity, says Thomas Merton, is the silence in which alone Christ can be heard. Her silence is the silence in which alone Christ can be heard and the voice of God becomes to us an experience through contemplation. Now, we can stop for questions, but if you've got 10 more minutes, I'll give you a final suggestion. What do you think? Okay, those of you who sit like this and want to go home are outvoted by all those people in the back. Trust me, video people, the people in the back said yes. So here's the final suggestion. When the angel departed from her, a beautiful fiat does not guarantee us a big dose of the warm fuzzy. Sometimes, often, it leads us utterly alone. And I would suggest that that sense of aloneness is part of the totality of our offering to God. It's part of our abandonment to the God whose ways are not our ways. I wonder if when a soul has given itself totally to God, God then feels as if all is well with it and it's okay to move on to somebody else. What kind of God is this? And the answer is we don't know. But here's a suggestion. The departure of the angel, the sense of abandonment, precisely when one God when one turns to God and accepts the challenge of the divine will is to preserve the mystery of God's person and presence. The departure of the angel, the abandonment, is to preserve the mystery of God's person and presence. We don't live in a tit-for-tat universe. God isn't good, isn't always rewarded and evil punished. Perfectly good and innocent people suffer dreadfully, as the diaries of saints and great Christians attest. Taking on God's assignments does not guarantee us God's presence or consolation. If you don't believe me, read Mother Teresa of Calcutta's Come Be My Light. Like the rain falling on the just and the unjust, God's love is a constant, whether we feel it or not. We don't earn it or deserve it, and we certainly don't earn it by being good or obedient. God loves us no matter how we feel and what we do or don't perceive. As the Carmelite Ruth Burroughs has written, God loves me not because I'm good, but because God is good. The givenness of God's love, which theology terms grace, I think reminds us of how surface and superficial and ephemeral emotional life is and how important it is to follow Mary's example and trust what we don't feel and can't see 
and don't understand. Of course God's absence can only be apparent. God is being itself, so God can't be elsewhere. God, uh, Paul quoted this to the Athenians. God is the one in whom we live and move and have our being. And yet, in an odd way, I think the angel's departure, that sense of God's absence, might be a gift. That sense of angelic departure, of God's absence, might be a way of preventing us from falling into the theological tit-for-tat trap. It might be the way in which we are invited to a deeper surrender, a more profound acceptance, a more complete living of our lives in the mystery of God. It might be how the divinity maintains its mystery. In his monograph on Mary, Andrew Loth writes, in the language of paradox, God makes himself known as unknowable and discloses himself as mystery. The virgin birth, I'm going to continue the quotation, the virgin birth points to the mystery or secret of revelation. It points to God's unveiling of himself by his veiling of himself in human form. Mary, in her ascent to the divine invitation, becomes the mother of God. She becomes the veil that conceals God in order to reveal him. She brings forth for us the secret of revelation and makes possible our access to that secret. Thomas Merton expressed the same idea slightly differently. Mary's sanctity is the silence in which alone Christ can be heard. It is ironic, but our perception of absence may be a byproduct of the incarnation which Mary facilitated. God comes among us to show us how precisely, by becoming fully human, God is so different from us. It is the embrace of our humanity that we so often avoid. Divinity takes it on in order to give it back to us perfected. Mary didn't avoid her humanity. All those fade depictions of Our Lady in filmy nightgowns or the regalia of medieval nobility get it desperately wrong. Mary had her human self. She had her body. She had her very young woman's body, and she offered it, she put all its messy procedures at God's disposal. She said yes, and the angel departed, and the corner of the veil of the mystery, which is the reality of God with us everywhere, was lifted just a little bit. And the fullness of time had begun, and the redemption of the whole cosmos had begun. For with God, nothing is impossible. And to paraphrase dear old Elizabeth, blessed are they, blessed are we, who believe there will be a fulfillment of what was spoken to Mary by the Lord. You're in trouble. There are four batteries here, which means I can go on more and more and more. But this would be a good moment. We have some time um, if you'd like to ask a question or make a comment or object to something. Um, it's OK if you object. We'll still be friends. We won't be as good friends, but we'll still be friends. So please feel free if you have a question. I think there are some microphones available to you. Um, thank you so much, Bonnie, for your talk. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Um, 
You mentioned that if you do the math, um, we know that Mary was with Elizabeth and, until she was full term. Um, I remember reading once or someone told me that Mary left Elizabeth just before she was to give birth yeah. so that things would happen in the right order and so that John would be born sort of without Mary there uh -huh. because Jesus would then need to be baptised. Is that something that... I've never heard it before. It's an interesting theory. That's the best I can say. All I did was the mathematics of the thing. You know, six months and three months meant that Elizabeth at least was full term with Mary still there. And I spun that a little bit. I'm a little uneasy with the eisegesis that would tell us why Mary did what she did. The text doesn't tell us that. Um, I, you know, I'm an old pedant. I spent 30 years teaching New Testament and Greek at the university and seminary level. So um, I was always saying to the students, is it in the text? What does the text say? <laughs> blah, blah, blah. It's a fascinating theory yeah. because we know John and Jesus are going to have massive overlap later. Mm -hmm. And actually, if you read the sermons of, of John the Baptist in Matthew and Luke, but particularly in Luke, and then you look at the first teachings of Jesus, it's pretty clear Jesus took notes when his cousin was preaching. So um, there certainly is over, overlay in that. In that. Thank, you. that. thank you, that's a very interesting idea. There are many of us in Australia who um, are struggling at the moment to come to grips with uh, some of our hopes and things that might have been dashed over the weekend, particularly in terms of us being a more compassionate. We kind did of it two years ago, I'm right yeah. with you, brother. So, <laughs> I was about to say it might be a similar situation there in America, but um, that uh, dynamic you spoke about in the talk about you know accepting vulnerability, seeking community, pondering and trusting, I think is a kind of powerful one in the context of looking at the world. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that sure. um, and in our response to those sort of things? Yes, in fact, there was um, a, a woman who spoke in the um, Sydney talk, was Sydney talk, that came up with this same idea. Honestly, I have to tell you, I was trying to address the common crises that we're, we're now facing together. Of course, I didn't know what your political situation was going to be, but I certainly know what ours is. And we are sharing a certain crisis of faith in one another in the church and trust in one another in the church. So what I was really doing was to try to address that um, uh, in a roundabout kind of way. And it strikes me that these things that I'm suggesting were Mary's responses are in fact responses that will help us in the situation that we're, that we're in. We're vulnerable now. And we might as well admit it. And, and find out what we can learn through that vulnerability. And we can't, whatever's gonna happen, we're gonna need each other to get through it. Right? And if we're wise, we don't act before we ponder. That's, you know, acting is not the first step. Um, we have to think about these things and, and intellectualize them and bring them into the heart. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of work to be done, I think, before we, we act in one way or another. And ultimately, I think we have to trust. This is not the first time that political systems have been messed up in anybody's country. This is certainly not the first crisis the church has faced or the first bit of corruption, right? I mean, we, we've been through it before. What we have to do is, I think, focus on what's really critical, eternal and enduring and live like him and live like her. In, in times like these, it behooves us, my mother used to say this to me, you, it behooves you, and now here I am, sounding just like my mother. <laughs> it behooves us to really be the people we say we are, to be Christian, to be um, those who are devoted to Our Lady, because we have to show the other way. Otherwise, the darkness wins. We, we have to really now look after the people that our political systems are gonna leave behind. We have to be faithful in the face of untrustworthiness in some of our institutions. 
it, it, pay, it puts a huge onus on us, I think, to, to, do what, to do and to be, but first to be and to ponder what we're supposed to be and do. You think? That doesn't mean we have to like it. I mean, the circumstances that we're in, but. You mentioned that Mary, that, he was, um, that she pondered, Mary pond, and this ponder, the word, the Greek word, was different according to the circumstances mm -hmm. she found herself in. Yeah. Okay. Is this pondering, and you also spoke about how this pondering was um, her growth, Maybe. But maybe, yeah. But would you say to, could you, sorry, that, that that pondering and that growth and the grace and the trust that came from that pondering was um, part of the incarnation and part of her incarnation as the mother of the, of the, that's, of the Lord? That's very interesting. I think so. Um, you know, I'm not, I'm not a process theologian. Uh, I'm pretty uneasy about some things about process theology. But there, there was something, I think, of, and, and I know what question this is going to lead to, but there was something about Our Lady's, um, Our Lady's pondering and process that God must have known about her from forever. Do you know what I mean? He, God must have had some insight into this young, very young woman, probably, and her qualities, her, her sanctity, her holiness, her wisdom, that, that made her a good choice. And, and so the choice was offered to her. And she was able to live into it. It's extraordinary. I mean, I think about what I was like at 13. It wasn't sancti. It wasn't holiness, I'll tell you that. <laughs> you could ask my folks if they were still living. And that choice and that growth um, is that Jesus, that and what Jesus in Jesus's ministry, that was incarnated in his ministry. I think so. That's a really interesting question. Now we're going to get to a point that I used to argue about with my seminarians. Um, I used to. Uh, Marx is the gospel I probably know best, and I used to suggest that we can see in that first gospel the development of Jesus' self-understanding. And interestingly, I think you're probably right that each of these points, we could find biblical passages or gospel passages in which we see those same qualities in Jesus. I mean, for sure, if you read the Magnificat and then you go read the Sermon on the Mount in Luke, he got it from Mama. He learned it at his mother's knee. If we can see those, you know, those points in the Magnificat as crucial to the preaching of Jesus, there was a very profound connection between those two people. Profound connection that, that is mystery to us. You know, we see it's we don't see it in essence. We see the byproduct of it, if I can put it that way. Those are very good questions. Thank you. Thank you. Now, this is more a comment than a question, but I'd like a reaction. Um, at the time of conception, Mary's conception of Jesus, there was no male component, human male component in that conception. It doesn't change one iota of what I believe in my faith about Mary and what Jesus said, but I could believe there was no female component also. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not... I'm not are you suggesting... So the, the so embryo was completely from God? Completely from the female? No. No, there was no, fem there was no male, human, male component. Gotcha, I'm with And there was no female, human component. Oh, well, that's interesting. I don't think we can know. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not, you know, I'm not, um, you know, I'm a believer. I'm not a skeptic. I'm, I'm willing to accept what minds greater than mine uh, have, have decided about Mary. I, and I honestly, to tell you the truth, I don't worry about the biology of it very much. Um, I think there's another, I, I'm not, I don't think it's unimportant, but I think there are other ways to think about it. I know people do worry about it, but whatever, however the baby came to be, 
it came to be in the womb of Mary, and she was his mother, and with all the rights and privileges thereunto pertaining, if I were using legal language. Fair enough? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, that's part of the mystery of how God works for me, and I'm willing to, to leave that in the, in the realm of mystery. You know, it's believing something because God told us it was true. Now, I hope that doesn't sound fundamentalist to you, because I, I don't really think I'm an old fundy. But in some things I am, because there are a few things that does seem to me are fundamental to our faith as Christians. But what that might be, you and I might disagree about. I'm going to suggest we close with gasp prayer. And we're going to sing the Salve together in Latin. So. Crank it up, guys, who haven't thought about Latin for a long time. Okay? I, I love that, um, that paradigm you've created, or that, yeah, that, the paradigm you've created for us of vulnerability, community, pondering, and trusting. And I, you know, I can think of many times in the church history and even in the life of our Australian church and the U.S. church and, um, and even our own little association that, that that actually feels it's a circle. You know, you come around to trust. And, and from that position of trust, you almost have two parts, you know, you have hubris and confidence and perhaps overconfidence, or you have, um, you know, a reigniting of vulnerability that leads you into that, that same pattern again. And I just, I, uh, for me, um, I'm reflecting on the times where we've, as a church and as a people, have come to that position of trust and, and misinterpreted it, and that's often led us into very dark places. Yeah. And, um, and also not trying to keep vulnerability too much at bay mm. leads us to dark places because then we get reactionary. We try to get ahead of the processes of God to make us feel safe when sometimes what we need to experience is that lack of safety. Mm. It's interesting to me, I just was thinking as you said that, um, uh, William Butler Yeats, the great Irish poet, also wrote some very interesting uh, prose works, and he has an image of the gyres. Does anybody, anybody a, a Yeats scholar and remember that? But he talks about how humans develop. As we go around, we go through the same process, but if we're wise, we're at a little higher level each time. Now, I'm not too happy about the latter as an image of spiritual life, although it's an old one, but, but that image seems to me there's something very helpful about it, that, that we go around, and we come to the same place, but we don't. We're, we're because of what we've been through and learned and experienced and thought about, we come out at, at a slightly better place or a more able place each time we go through these processes. But it is my great pleasure on behalf of the Marist Associ Association and all of us here tonight, Bonnie, we've had the privilege of hearing you to offer you our thanks. Um, we, you said at the start that we're a long way from everywhere, and we are a long way from everywhere. No, I said you're a long way from home. Yeah, a long way, me, but not, <laughs> not from everywhere. This is a where, right? We are. Yeah, that's right. And it is our. It is absolutely our privilege to have people such as yourself take the time, and time is such a precious thing. But to take the time to come and be with us and share uh, what you know in person and share your wisdom, and most importantly, to share who you are, because I think a lot of what we've experienced tonight is not just the immense wealth of knowledge and deep wisdom that you have, but it, through the person that you are, that is conveyed in a way that makes it all the more meaningful. So thank you so much Most for welcome. giving your time to come and be with us across Sydney, uh, Brisbane, and here with us in Melbourne for the Marian Lectures this year. And we'll look forward to seeing what writings are coming. Was particularly interested to hear about your new little discovery about the three different iterations of the world pondering word pondering and uh, maybe there's some some writing in there for you something for us all to keep pondering um, as time goes by so thank you You're so much welcome. and we've got a very small I token i love australia <laughs> very small great token. continent great continent thank you small token of our appreciation thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much thank you, thank you. And, um, Thank you very much indeed. A reminder to everybody at home, so we're going to conclude with a prayer and the singing of the Salve, and then the online will close off. Before we begin, uh, do we have a musician among us who would like to pitch this for us? Does somebody sing? Will you do that for us? At the very end, I'll, I'll, I'll cue you, brother. I thought we would pray two prayers <coughs> this evening. The first is a prayer for communities, for everybody in the night, this night, and then 
a brief prayer for ourselves individually, and then we'll sing the Salve together. So there'll be two brief prayers. Keep watch, dear Lord, with those who work or watch or weep this night, and give your angels charge over those who sleep. Tend the sick, Lord Christ. Give rest to the weary. Bless the dying. Soothe the suffering. Pity the afflicted. And shield the joyous. And all for your love's sake. Amen. Give us this night, O Lord, the peace of mind which is truly rest. Take from us all envy of anyone else, all resentment for anything which has been withheld from us, all bitterness against anyone who has hurt or wronged us, all anger against the apparent injustices of life, all foolish worry about the future and futile regret about the past. Help us to be at peace with ourselves, at peace with our fellow human beings, at peace with you, that we may lay down to rest in peace through Jesus Christ our Lord. Oh, oh, oh.